Hello and welcome. I'm Ariana Rivera Lee, Programming Coordinator at Zocalo Public Square. At Zocalo, our mission is to connect people to ideas and to one another. Everything we do is free and everyone is welcome. We publish original writing and present conversations like this one. Find us at ZocaloPublicSquare.org and all the main podcast platforms. If you enjoy today's conversation, please like it, follow us, or subscribe. We're about to hear from WorkCred Senior Director of Research, Isabel Cardenas Navia, who joins us today to talk about building a new system that transforms hiring practices while fueling innovation. I'm thrilled to introduce Issues in Science and Technology Editor-in-Chief, Lisa Marganelli. Over to you, Lisa. Thank you, Ariana, and hello, everyone. I'm Lisa Marganelli, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Issues in Science and Technology. We're a quarterly journal published by the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, and by Arizona State University. And you can find us at issues.org on the web. We are delighted to partner with Zocalo Public Square today to, pub to present today's conversation, which asks, is it time to throw away our resumes? Joining me today is Dr. Isabel Cardenas uh, Navia, who explores that possibility in a recent essay for issues titled, Everything You've Ever Learned. This is a very issues type story because it looks at the junction of technology and policy. One of the big dreams of society is that every worker has a job that they kind of like and they're really well suited for and every employer has the employees they need and everybody's getting the right wage and obviously we're not living in this world so the one of the big the one hope is that could technology and the right policies kind of solve this and make a situation where workers have better jobs employers are able to innovate everyone gets the right amount of money um so I'm very excited to be in part of this, having this conversation with you. Um, Isabel is the Senior Director of Research at WorkCred, which is an affiliate of the American National Standards Institute, whose mission is to strengthen workface, workforce quality by improving the credentialing system. She was previously the Director of Emerging Workforce Programs with the Business Higher Education Forum, and she also has a PhD in biomedical engineering. Isabel, thank you for speaking with me today. To start off, so to I'd like to know. Um, I'd I'd love to know, is everything that you've ever done on your resume, workforce wise? No, no, <laughs> no. I made the transition to uh, shifting from biomedical research to workforce about ten years ago, and so I've essentially deleted, not deleted. Uh, I have there are many emissions in my resume from the first eight years of t eight to 10 years of my work. So all of my graduate work and my postdoc uh, is is noted because you don't have any gaps in your resume, but I've, I've really eliminated all the skills that at the time seemed so important to my my resume. And so or to my you know ability to get a job, to go into mm -hmm. uh, doing research in the biomedical engineering sort of world. And so now, if you look at my resume, I think all the things that I thought were so important, uh, my technical skills, my peer reviewed publications, um, you know, that you sort of agonize over to get your, your PhD are all missing from my resume. And I got a traditional two page one with which really focuses on workforce. And, you know, the work that I've been doing since I uh, started doing uh, work with initially with the Navy and then with uh, Business Higher Education Forum and now with WorkCred.
Did you lose me? I I think I did. I can you still can you see me now? I can see you now. Sorry about this. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, I'm going to do this through my phone then. Um, and um, so to go back to where we were, um, let's, you were talking about how you are a biomedical engineer and you have cut, severely edited your resume as you've made the transition to doing workforce credibility um, and, and credentialing. So um, let's, let's kind of go to the central question here of like, what's the matter with resumes? They've worked for four generations. They're cheap. Anybody can go to the library. You can sit down there. You just open up MS Word or, or Google Docs practically, and they, and they get generated for you. You get little prompts to fill them in. So what's, what's the problem? So, so I'll, I'll, I'll sort of, I'll say it's not just resumes. It's sort of the whole system that relies on resumes to get hiring. And so mm -hmm. you know, starting on the employer side, which is that because they get hundreds or thousands of resumes for a position, they're using technology screening tools. And so you could spend as much time trying to find the right keywords for your resume as you, you know, more time than that than you would on actually interviewing. That's really not the purpose of, of a resume is to sort of trigger the right keywords. I think that the other piece is that there are sort of standard fields that you expect to have in a resume. And so, you, you know, education, experience, maybe publications, languages spoken. Uh, but if you, you think about someone who maybe only has a high school diploma and who's been working for 30 years at the same employer, versus someone who just graduated from high school and has been working three years at that same employer, the resumes don't look that different, but obviously their skills and knowledge and ability are very different. And so resumes really can't capture the richness of uh, someone's experience. And, and I would just say more than that, uh, I think that resumes don't have the ability for you to validate knowledge that isn't uh, on an existing credential. So if you have you know spent a lot of your life learning something um if you can sort of social media is a great example right people have these incredible social media profiles about skills that they have and they will not have any formal education in that area and so how do you cap how does a resume capture that it really does fall short right you can't really capture who's an influencer and who isn't and who really knows how to use <laughs> all of these tools that's also That's right. true in programming. It's really interesting. Um, so you've written for us about how digital records, um, LER, which are called learning educational records, could somehow replace resumes or could be sort of, they could solve some of the problems that resumes present currently. So let's back up a little bit. Can, how did you, I've never heard of LERs before I uh, saw your piece. So how did you hear about them? And, and what was so your it, first sort of impression of them? So it was completely by chance. My, my boss is on the advisory board for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation and some of their workforce efforts. And he was unable to make a meeting. So he sent me, I think this was like my second week at work cred. And I was like, okay, <laughs> like I'll go, I'll take notes. And I uh, was immediately intrigued actually when this, the topic of these learning and employment records came up because I immediately saw uh, how they could be a data source that all the different, you know, stakeholders in the sort of employment or the education and workforce system could use and it could provide value to all of them. And so I, I was sort of came away from that meeting telling raving to my boss about how great the meeting was and, uh, and and really telling him that I wanted to get involved in the, the work on the learning and employment records. Interesting. So you suddenly saw that something much bigger was going on than a thing that would replace resumes. Okay. So let's talk about what is like, so an LER is, it's digital. You can put all kinds of stuff on it you um and and how does it kind of um how is it verified how does it take care of verification so 
what what is unique about the LER? There's a number of characters that are unique about the LER, but the, the validation is a key part of it. So instead of you putting on your resume, I graduated from, you know, state university in, you know, whatever year. And then when your employer hires you, they go and they validate, right? They, they go check and see that you actually have that degree. The, the actual, the, the university would go and put that on your LER. And so if you shared that part of your LER with a potential employer, they don't have to go and validate it. It's already, it's, it's been validated by the fact that that's the institution that placed it on your um, L, on your LER. And I, I think the other thing that is unique about LERs is to incorporate metadata. So you get right LER that you can out, which has all the entries that you have in there, but there's all this that's buried in there. And so, for example, going back to that same degree program, you know, if you send a, you know, a traditional validation might validate that you have a degree from your employer, the LER can include all the courses. If the institution has managed to break those courses down into competencies, it could then list the competencies for each course. So you have this ability to offer a lot more information than just, you know, on your resume where you have, you know, bachelor's degree, such and such state, such and such university. Right. So you're sort of not constrained. And like if you're if you're a person who's taught yourself all sorts of things, you can put that on there. How would that get verified? You can So that's <laughs> that's the million dollar question, right? Or sixty four thousand dollar question, right? Um so that's that's what people are working on. I think right now, right, the easy place to start when you start with any technology, you usually start with some of the easier, and I, that's all relative. Um, but the, the easiest stuff is, you know, a university has a process for awarding credentials. So do certification bodies. So do, you know, other types of education and training providers. Um, you know, we've seen an explosion of digital badges or other types of, of credentials. And so there are providers who know how to do it. And so that's the easy, easy part is to just validate existing credentials. There needs to be a process um, by which individuals can have other skills validated. And, and so there, I, I think that that is sort of yet to be determined is who is that validator, right? Who is trusted by employers, who is trusted by the individuals to do that validation. And, you know, at, at the same time, you know, what is, who bears the cost of, of doing mm -hmm. the validation? And the, what, I, what I've definitely learned since I've come to work cred is, is it a fair validation, right? Is it, right. Re, is it, is it, do, is the, the testing or whatever assessment done, is it a fair and valid assessment? Okay. So there's a whole bunch of like, there's just a crazy tangle of questions about this once you sort of get beyond the first, the first idea. So let's sort of back more. So we're going to, one of the things that we need to explore here is how do you make it fair? How do you make it equitable? How do you give um, workers who may not have a college degree a really fair shake in the labor market? I mean, one of the things that you that you mentioned is that people with a college, without a college degree, 70% of them could be making more than their salary or something like that. A very large percent, tell me how many people could be making more than they are right now. <laughs> I, I would, it is, it's, it's a very large number. And I, I think, you know, part of it is when we talk about the uh, inefficiency in the workforce system, it's on a lot of levels. It's on, you know, it's place-based, finding the right job, um, it's right. being able to connect. But I mean, I, you know, looking at it from the other side, those are the types of things the internet has been able to solve for us, right? We, there's a lot of those right. parts, which is being able to find the right fit for something, finding your right community or that. So, so technology is, is a great potential solution for this. And so, uh, for for all of for those folks who who are looking to find the right fit for their skill set, um, LERs find it, hope you know hopefully it would be as easy as a Google search. You're like, here's my LER. Where are the jobs in my area that could 
you know, fit for me at, with these salary constraints. Right. So maybe you're up, you're in this sort of pool and all the time employers are coming to you and saying, hey, would you like this job? Hey, would you like this job? Are, are you interested in my job? Because they see that you have your unique skills. And um, currently what you have to do is you have to go get your resume together and go out and shop yourself around to different people. And this might make, it might make it so that they could come find you more easily. Yes, is, absolutely. That's one of the, yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, and it's interesting, uh, there's been a poll that was just done uh, in the audience and they asked, does your resume demonstrate your experience well? And most people said somewhat, which is funny. I mean, I guess we all have kind of ambivalent feelings about the resume and maybe we're gonna be okay with when they go away. Um, so, but what I wanna talk about actually here is um, you mentioned, you just mentioned the internet and in your piece, you said, just as the internet set off a revolution in communication, commerce and community building, LERs could transform education and workforce processes, policies, and communities in ways we cannot foresee at all. And so we're sort of in this very early days where we really have to kind of imagine what's going to happen and think it through. Um, what are some of the, what are, what are your big concerns? Your, your sort of three biggest concerns for equitability. So, so I, I think that my it's definitely who who accesses and who adopts LERs. I think that we know there remains a digital divide. So that's just, you know, sort of one piece of it. These would be digital resumes. It's not about having a piece of paper and access to a printer. You really need to be able to access the the uh, internet in some way. Um, I think adoption, if you look at platforms right now, the jobs platforms that are out there, they skew towards certain professions and they tend to skew to profession towards professions that have degrees. Um, and mm -hmm. so, you know, you could leave out, you know, a, a huge segment of the population if employers adopt this for job hunting in certain areas and not in others. And on the flip side, right, you could also, uh, you know, if you if you think about that division there, you could say, well, you know, these types of people go to this website to, or this app to use their LER and these types of professions are at this one. And so you create this sort of uh, segmentation of the, the job market further. And so employers, so, so then you're not really as an individual, you're not really getting access for employers searching all of the different LERs. They're really still going right to these pools of who, where they think they can find the right kinds of applicants. And right. then I think the other other thing I'll bring up is when you're so talking you're sort about of, huge amount. Oh, so you're sort of um, rebuilding some of the inequities that we see in society already, but you're rebuilding them almost in more um, concrete and 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 uh, ways through through this new technology. Right, and the technology in some ways hides it, right? Because it, it tells you it's empowering mm -hmm. you and you're not sort of seeing that it is in fact recreating these same systems. Yeah. And along, along those same lines, anytime you're talking about technology and huge amounts of data, you're talking about AI. And, you know, if you think about now I think Google is pretty good about searching for things. But when you first search things in Google, it brought up crazy, right? And right. and you'll you'll begin and it's because you know they were getting their out making their algorithms better and they were continually improving things. Um, you're going to have that same learning curve with LERs and doing that matching. And so if there isn't some deliberate approach that recognizes that these are these are the foreseeable things that we're concerned about, right? What are the unforeseeable right. things? And someone who is constantly sort of checking and thinking about that as the technology is being developed, so you don't have to, you know, go back and try to fix it later. Yeah, right. So the part of this and part of what we're doing today is trying to imagine where this goes. So one of the other things before we. Uh, go off into more of the details, one of the big picture things is that um, there's really been a lot of adoption of 
of the idea of LERs from some really big players. There's, um, you know, you mentioned uh, the Chamber of Commerce. There's 150 universities who are doing some sort of experiment or pilot programs. The DOD has a pilot program. Walmart, Google, IBM, Salesforce. Is there a big push to put this in everyone's little digital pause? So I think that there is a huge recognition that our workforce system is very inefficient and the education system is inefficient and it's inequitable. And so mm -hmm. there is a desire to be able to, and I'll speak specifically to, you know, sort of thinking about skills and non-degree credentials as, you know, equally valid ways to hire. Right now, you know, degrees are, are sort of, I think no one argues about hiring with degree requirements. Well, that's a conversation now, but it's people, uh, I think, generally understand that degrees, you know, mean certain things and have a certain value when hiring. I think that given the inequities we see in higher education and who has access to degrees and who could attain degrees, that there is a strong desire by employers to move beyond degrees and do skills, look at skills, look at uh, other types of credentials. But that concern about validity and fairness is, is still a real one. They, they want to be able to feel comfortable uh, that the skills on someone's resume really are their skills. Mm -hmm. So, so part of this comes from employers really wanting to have more sort of control or, or more of a sense that they're getting what they've asked for. I think that, but, but also that desire to broaden beyond the, when they're looking for their workforce for different types of jobs. I think there's okay. a lot of, yeah. There's research so that's been done that sort of shows degree has creeped, right, in terms of its requirements. That used to be that, you know, folks who did administrative work didn't need a degree and now they do. And so I think employers are sort of recognizing they may have gone too far and are trying to figure out a way to, you know, still have quality hires, uh, mm -hmm. but, but not just depend on the degree for that screening. Okay, so part of this is sort of a bit of a pushback against the idea of degrees and and looking for skills separate from degrees. And that has really interesting implications for how we start to educate ourselves. Um, it, and just picking up on that, I think that's part of the reason that higher education institutions are also picking up on this. Um, you know, I, I sort of addressed the employer piece, but higher education institutions recognize that their learners are learning more than just the classroom work as they proceed through getting their degree. And they want to capture the richness of that educational experience and learning that you've done. Uh, and I think that's part of why they feel that these uh, learning and employment records are a great, uh, are, are something that could support their learners in their career pathways. Okay, interesting. And I, you mentioned a little bit about how um, uh, particularly for STEM careers, people have a lot of different skills. They have the ability, you know, some people have the ability to work at lab benches. There are technicians with incredible skills that they acquire kind of on the job. And then the, they would be transferable, but they're, if they could explain to the next employer what they could do. So talk to me a little bit about this with STEM, and then let's talk a little bit about what the implications are for a more innovative workforce. But Absolutely. let's start off with telling me a little bit about STEM. Yes, I mean, I, I think, you know, certainly my experience, and now I've, I've left the, the lab more than 10 years ago, but all of my skills would be out of date. I mean, I think the, 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 in terms of the technical skills, um, I don't think anyone would want to put me in front of, you know, have me some pipettes and, and tell me to, you know, run a, a gel. I, right. I, so these are I, very I, but, specific you know, things that people do in labs. Yeah. The, the pipettes yes, and the gel. Yes. 
Yeah. And, and so, so I think that when you think about sort of the continual evolution of, and, and it's, it's technology in many ways, it's technology is transforming the science. It's how we do science, how we work in our labs. Um, you know, I think now how scientists can collaborate you know, it's all being influenced by these needs. And so one, you know, if you're in the STEM field, you need to be able to stay up to date and none of those skills, right? Like I have a colleague who we did the same postdoc together and he stayed in the field and I haven't, and we have the same credentials, right? We both have PhDs, we both have our postdoc and we have different job titles after that, but his skill set is so deep and up to date compared to my skill set. And mm -hmm. that only comes from being in, but none of that is captured in his resume, right? His resume will be his publications, his job titles, and, right. and that's it. And so you, there's so much that you miss in, and, and, and in the sciences, it matters so much. I mean, that was sort of my experience. It's like, it matters so much that you are up to date on the skill sets. Uh, and, and so that you're able and able to use the technology and use the equipment and do those collaborations. So let's talk about the implications of this for innovation. I mean, we need to be having a workforce that is constantly training and learning new things to be able to have this sort of, you know, world competitive or this is the what's talked about is that we need to have a workforce that's very highly developed where everybody from from the person who cleans the clean room to the person who is, you know, directing the experiments, all of these people are are highly skilled and fully understand their job, and and are sort of working, continuing to to get new skills, um, in order to have a really innovative economy. Um, how do how do LERs play into this? How do they create different incentives for employers and employees? I think that there's a couple of different levels which I think LERs could play. And so I think one is at the individual level. Um, the other thing that one hopes that LERs could do is they could help you direct your career pathway. So you could say, this is my skill set now. You know, here is a skill set or this is, you know, the type of skill set I would need for this job. How do I get there? And so they could help you sort of figure out how to navigate that pathway and skill yourself up to the next level. Uh, I think okay. it felt like a black box when I was in the sciences to think about sort of what are those skills I need to get to the next level. Right, right. And then I think- So it encourages employees, it, it encourages workers to develop new skills and, to, and, and makes it them realize that they can get to the next thing. I, mean, I might even go stronger. I would say I think it empowers folks. I think in the sciences, sometimes, you know, your I certainly let me say this, I'll put it, I'll say it myself. I did not always feel empowered to go and you know say, hey, I want to go do this. I need to learn this skill set, which will take me to where I want to go in my career. So I'm not, I'm not getting, I didn't get what your last response was. To have the they need about where they can take it to the next level. So it's important to encourage us. I really would hope that LER would be a to do that. Okay, so it's empowering to people. Um, One hopes. <laughs> yeah, so um, we have, uh, I, I want to get in, go on to the next section uh, to sort of talk about the best case scenario in terms of making a much more innovative economy um, and whatever the worst case scenarios are. But just before we go, there's a question from the audience about could we explain the technology behind LERs again? Can we explain it again? So first of all, it's a digital record. It's sort of on the internet. And secondly, it's, it is 
backed up in digital ledgers around the world? It's the same type of use for chain. For blockchain. Digital ledger. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, the idea is that it's tampered with because it is, uh, you know, exists, the record exists in so many computers and it's verified uh, so that, you know, when someone puts something on there, you, you can tell who it is. There's a digital signature of who put it on there. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so let's talk about how does this sort of power an innovative economy um, going, you know, what is the dream? What's like the best case scenario? And then let's go towards like, what is the worst case scenario? And so we can start to discuss some of the details of what we need to pay attention to. So what's the worst, what's the best case scenario here? beyond empowering so I, think, I I I think that it is sort of how you started this, which is people can find the right job for their skill set at, you know, a wage that they want to get for it. And, you know, it it hopefully allows them to have, as you say, more ease of access to applying for jobs. So you're you're not limited to you know whatever you happen to be find when you were searching a job site that day, or you know even more um, is all those jobs that you know are not that connections are a terrible thing, but all the jobs that are never posted and are done through connections. Right. Hopefully, this would make the the playing field more equitable when it comes to individuals finding jobs uh, that make them happy. Right. But the innovation possibility is that we end up with sort of a supercharged economy where workers can move from one place to another. And that makes that also, and there is sort of a, everyone is upskilling and employers are no longer looking for the, the right person for the job that, and that holds them back. So there is this hope yeah. that that's kind of where we're going with it. Yes. Yes, I mean, it just makes the system more efficient. Um, and, and I think, you know, when you think about sort of the turbulent system of all the technology, you know, inventing new careers and eliminating careers, hopefully mm -hmm. this would allow someone to, to uh, employers, right, as well as individuals to crosswalk skill sets from one position that may be being eliminated to one that is not. And so everyone okay. hopefully is also able to participate instead of dropping out of the workforce or becoming discouraged in, in their job searches. Okay, now let's talk about some of the like not good case scenarios. <laughs> what are some of the worst case scenarios? <laughs> so I think my, and maybe I'm, I, I think that for me, what would be a depressing for this is came something like, you know, task rabbit where employers are like, here's my 10 things that need to be done. And you just contract out everything. And so there's no real relationship or investment by the employer into an individual. It's just sort of people are, you know, expect, you know, replaceable bots that can be brought in to a task to do a job. Yeah. And even they might hire people for, for two months and not invest in in training their workers and that kind of thing. Yeah, that's right. And then there's kind of um, then let's talk about some of the what are the things that we really need to keep our eye on these sort of essential bits of infrastructure. If we think of this as the beginning of the internet, we have you know we have privacy wasn't a really big concern in 1996. Privacy yeah. is a huge concern now. Let's let's start with privacy and then go on sort of through the laundry list of the things that we need to be concerned about. So so yes, I think privacy is obviously huge. And I think that, you know, when you think about the number of individuals who can participate in this type of system, um, you want privacy. And I think you you don't there's many folks who don't want like a giant government database, right? And so mm -hmm. There's, there's different um, 
just addressing the concerns from the different stakeholders and making sure that the, the technology is set up in a way that people feel like they're benefiting. I mean, we all give up our privacy when we install new apps on our phone, right? But people think right. they're getting some benefit from that. And so that, that sort of balance of benefit needs to be there. I think the, the one that I uh, have been keeping the closest eye on or there's, is, is that interoperability is the mm -hmm. ability to, you know, regardless of who it is that you are using, you know, like, like the internet, it didn't matter sort of which uh, internet browser you used, you were able to access web pages. And that was because right. there were these data standards that the technology developers used and were communicated to others. And so you had this interoperability. And so, that is something that interoperability of data does not currently exist in our workforce system. So higher education institutions have different data they store um, and, and communicate about their uh, learners than employers or, um, you know, or how you might want to, you know, put something about yourself out there. And so there's right now there's no data standard. Um, that, that can communicate across all of these. So LERs is, is an opportunity to do that, but if it fails to do that, it also makes everyone sort of stuck with, you know, their web browser to be able to use right. their LER. Right. And this explains why the American National Standards Institute is really interested in this. We need to have these things be interoperable and they have experience in developing standards so that all the plugs fit into all the sockets. Um, it, as well as on, on the internet. So um, one of the, the interoperability is a concern. Um, the security is also a concern because if you've got your digital distributed ledgers, that is also, well, tell, explain to me how the digital ledgers work and what and whether or not we've actually what what that means sort of for security. I mean, uh, digital ledgers are supposed to be secure in that you have the key and you are the one who can sort of unlock and share your digital ledger. And you know, certainly, you know, that's that's something that is being considered and built into the technology right now. I think the piece that comes along with it is you know, you don't want something so secure or so private, you can't share it with people. I mean, the whole, the whole value in these LERs is being to able to share what you want to share. And so there is that piece of, you know, is it, is, is the interface or is how you access and use the LER has to be relevant to the needs of the different users. And it has to be something that individuals are able to have control over. They want to, they get to select what they would like to uh, share with an employer. And, you know, and then one hopes that the employer wouldn't say, you have to share everything with me, that there really okay. is, you know, the ability for someone to say, no, I, you know, th these are like your resume, right? You get to select what right. you put on your resume. They can maintain that ability to sort of shape how you present yourself to someone. Right, that every every time you've screwed up or or went off to get a certificate and failed to get the certificate, that that is not what is presented. <laughs> right. The internet hasn't exactly worked out that way. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and how do we um, think about sort of equity? in in this how do we how do we build that in how, i mean should there be sort of a guaranteed um ler that everyone can have that's you know sponsored by the government or is there um what what are you thinking for equity so so i think that i would say that uh you know one of the things that we really have to consider is when you're thinking about now sort of even the early starts of you know or, or how LERs might initially start folk with the focus on credentials uh, more than half of credentials are not provided by higher education institutions they are provided
by, mm -hmm. by professional societies, by training providers, by certification bodies. And so there needs to be a recognition that higher education institutions are part of this system and part of who will participate in LERs, but it can't be everyone. Uh, because, you know, they're, not everyone is comfortable in a higher education institution. And so you need to broaden, you know, the number of folks who can, or institutions that can put entries into LER. So, so that complex piece needs to be figured out. Um, I think that there also needs to be, you know, hopefully an interface as easy as you know, an app or something that you can do on your smartphone that you can use and share your LER. I think right mm -hmm. now the technology is in its infancy. And so it's not as easy as like downloading an app and hey, this is what I'm sending to, to these folks or sharing with these folks. But that sort of relevance, uh, that interface is going to be really important to having access uh, for, for, for a broad set of individuals to use their LER. So some of the, those are, and then, and then of course the employers, I mean, the employers have an important role to play when they are using, if they're going to use LERs, they need to think about, you know, ensuring that they are getting, um, th they're trying to get, uh, I guess, think about how equity plays into that in terms of, you know, who can apply for their jobs and how how much they're using LERs to screen for for jobs. So initially, maybe it would be LERs plus their current systems, right? But they can't make the transition right away or you're going to just screen out um, a number of folks. So one of the questions that's come in is, can LERs help fight unconscious bias? I hope so. I really do. Which is a really I think interesting that, question. Yeah, I, I think that when I think about, um, you know, the, the and, and this is where, uh, you know, one, one, if one thinks about whatever uh, algorithms would be developed to use these LERs to screen, that that is part of the conversation and that is part of the development that is is going on and so you can um and as and then as employers use the LERs that they're going back to reflect on all those pitfalls that they know exist as part of the employment the current employment process and that they can make an effort to uh you know shift to different policies or procedures in their hiring to address things like unconscious bias. Interesting. So um, I, I think, well, one question I just wanna, I wanna go back to the um, sort of my, my final question is like, let's talk a little bit about who, how, how does this change happen? How do the standards get put in place? How does a person who's listening to this right now get involved in this process? And then we'll go to, we have a bunch of really interesting questions from the audience. So I, I don't a hundred percent have the answer to how do people get involved? I, I think right now because they're pilot projects. And so they have, you know, frankly, that the technology is still being worked out. And so I think the pilots are trying to sort of set a scope of folks who are involved. Uh, that being said, you know, it would be the the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has a uh, the, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation has it going on with these LER pilots, and you know if folks want to get involved and and be representatives, uh, you know that that is something that you know folk, everyone is is welcome to participate in and, and volunteer to to be uh, you know hopefully a part of of this solution. Um, so and, and then I think you know, as, and, and if you're at an institution, if you're at, that is participating in these LERs, as you said, there's 150, you know, mm -hmm. it would be great if you would go and if you're participating in, you know, they often call them uh, the, I'm going to say, now I can't remember the word, 
Um, but it's sort of like the, um, not alternate transcript, but it's it's sort of the the transcript of like skills and things like that. They're not necessarily calling them LPRs. Okay. Um, the comprehensive learning records, get involved and give feedback. Even if they don't ask you for feedback, give feedback because mm -hmm. those are the precursors and the feedback that's gotten on those will inform whatever LERs the universities ultimately participate in, ultimately develop. Okay, that's really interesting. So I wanna go now to a few of the audience questions. One is how would this help senior candidates? I hope this would really help senior candidates um, because there are so, there is a, um, let me take a step back and say, going back to this, what's missing on a resume, I think you can't list things like judgment or, you know, uh, good communicator necessarily on your resume. But I think that there mm -hmm. are a lot of those skills that are built up with experience. Doesn't, you don't have to have experience that are built up with experience that are not captured in credentials. And I think the farther away you are from your last credential, the harder it is to try to capture those skills. And so uh, generalizing, I would say seniors are probably the farthest away from their last credential. And so they may have a harder time being able to communicate and signal all the skills they have to employers. And so I think that this would provide a way to validate those skills and show the value of, of those years of experience uh, in or out of the workforce and how they could apply to a, a new a, a job. Interesting. So um, another question is, you know, are there does this sort of open up an even more global competition for jobs? Does this sort of is, uh, take away some of the the advantages of geography in ways that are going to change change things a lot? I mean, the internet certainly changed geography. In some ways, it could. I think a lot of that will depend on how willing employers are to have employees who are remote or how easily the jobs are being able to be done remotely. Uh, I certainly think it makes job hunting an easier skill. But I, I think, you know, maybe taking the that question at a slightly different level, which is how will this facilitate individuals to transition or move more smoothly, you know, whether that's from another country to the US or, you know, within different uh, educational providers, something like this will really empower or will really help out with things like stranded credits, which are a huge problem, right? They, those or credit for prior learning. If you come from a foreign mm -hmm. country and you have on there your competencies and you know you could have them translated, then you could get credit for prior learning. And so you would suddenly be, you know, you wouldn't have to worry about explaining, you know, exactly what your, your uh, educational program was, you would have that set of competencies. So yes, I mean, it, it would sort of maybe more globalize the competition, uh, but I, I'm not sure it would be quite as open as the internet in terms of, of being able to uh, do, do jobs from all over the world. Right. So, um... Okay, let's look back at some of these uh, audience questions. Um, one of the things is past experience is important, but what about a good fit? Are there going to be parts of LERs that, you know, look at like personal personality tests and all that sort of stuff? I mean, are we moving towards a more automated world um, of in, in that respect? So I think what I would turn that around and say that I hope that LERs actually move away from these personal judgments and move, they, they encourage employers to use sort of validated um, assessments. So if you want to talk about an assessment for, you know, gets along with coworkers or the types of things that might be a fit, that it's a valid assessment. It's not just based on, you know, how someone perceived you in an interview. Uh, and then, you know, 
in, in, if you think about the metadata and the information it can provide an individual, if, if, if companies were then providing metadata about their employees' LERs, uh, you know, an individual could also sort of see that and see what the fit, you know, what, what types of employees um, go there or are currently working there. And so that might help when you think about fit. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So, um, I'm sorry, I got I got kicked off. Um, so, to <laughs> this is, I, I mean, it's interesting. Here we are talking about this incredibly futuristic form of resumes and how the internet is going to evolve like the internet. And here we are having these wacky connection problems. Um, <laughs> And and it just kind of shows you that, you know, anything that can go wrong with technology will go wrong. And and this is sort of the the world that we're in with these is is trying to sort of vision ahead, you know, where we're really going and and what we're um, what we're really how we're really going to end up. And um, yes. so, yeah, um, so. Uh, Sorry, some of the other questions um, that we have from the audience are, um, what measures would be put in place to ensure that only the right people are able to access someone's information? That's a great question. Uh, so it should only be whoever it is that you give permission to access it. I think the what mm -hmm. that means, right? If you offer it to a company, the or or you know, then what is who at that company would have access to your LER? Uh, and so that would that that's something that actually the you know something like the the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation and the pilots there and the companies involved there could begin to think about policies around um, you know what are the from the employer viewpoint what are ethical ways to use the data and who at their organizations would be able to see the data so that it it's sort of you not used for purposes that the individual who is sharing it was intent was intending to use it for um <clears throat> that's interesting and some of the um I guess one of one of the things that's come up is that they did a poll in the audience and people talked about what they most disliked about um, about applying for a job and they said that the thing that they most disliked actually was um, writing a cover letter and I wonder <laughs> will this sort of change the cover letter? That's a really good question. Um, that's, I also very much dislike writing cover letters. <laughs> yeah. And I was and here, there's a typo in my cover letter, and that'll just follow Yeah, I, it's, it's the worst. <laughs> it's the absolute worst. <laughs> so um, what do you think? Can, it, can something happen with cover you know, letters? I, so so I, I think that what I would... I'm not sure that I, I, I think a lot of, um, when I think about the hiring process and how employers screen for things, you know, I, I do hope that this would get away from things like the cover letter, because I think that, and obviously I'm, I'm not an HR professional, but I, the cover letter is really mm -hmm. meant to write, give highlight and give context to your experience. And I think for individuals who, you know, are transitioning from, across fields or they may not be a perfect match for the job, the cover letter can really serve a, uh, can be more helpful than those who may be a perfect fit in terms of their background for the job. And I think from that sense, um, LERs can be helpful because you can, you know, in the same way that on LinkedIn, you have the ability to sort of, you know, craft your persona, um, you have the ability to decide which skills you'd like to put in and validate and then which skills to share with the employer 
And so hopefully that would allow you to show that fit without having to write a letter, you know, trying to, to show how your background, right, your two page resume or whatever, however many pages is, 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 you know, trying to go beyond that. I mean, they should provide a platform to be able to do that. I find also that current cover letters, oftentimes people, um, they're either, a lot of times they sift through with like a machine learning platform goes through and sifts mm -hmm. to see if the right um, keywords were used. And so sometimes the cover letter, in order to write a cover letter, you kind of have to think like a machine. And it would be really nice if people came out and looked for other people <laughs> in, the, in the cover letters. And yet the evolution of the cover letter and the way that they're received inside um, seems to be making us humans think more like machines so that we can, you know, kind of rise to the top of that, of that uh, queue there. Um, another person asked us, you know, does LinkedIn seem, uh, will LinkedIn evolve into some sort of an LER? Because it shows all the people you've ever met, um, in addition to everything yes. you've ever learned. So I, I think it's a really interesting question. And I'll, I'll just take a minute to sort of ponder this, which is, you know, it, it may be that one of the reasons that LERs may not make it is because LinkedIn fills enough of the need, right? And so, and there's already a huge user base and, you know, sometimes it's not the best technology that wins. Um, mm -hmm. And there's there's all different reasons why, why some, you know, ultimately last or, or last for longer than others. And so, uh, you know, I, I certainly, don't preclude the possibility that LinkedIn will adapt enough of what is, you know, what makes LERs useful. I mean, clearly there's a lot of, of use that people are already getting from it. And, you know, it's, it's been in the market longer, but again, looking back at the internet, it's hard to know. It's not always the first to market that make it or the ones that are the most ubiquitous. Um, but, you know, sometimes if you're there first, you, you, you last. So it's, it's, right. it's, yeah. I mean, there was a thing called Friendster and then there was a thing called MySpace. And then weirdly enough, Facebook was the one that lasted and people had all their friends up there. Um, going forward, sort of, are there are there two things that you're, or two or three things that you're watching? We're coming to the end of this um, and it's been really great to talk to you, but what are the sort of two or three things that you're really keeping your eye on to make sure that this um, goes forward in the sort of the most socially um, reasonable and uh, equitable way. I'm curious to see if the employers who are involved uh, start recognizing LERs or in integrating them into their workforce systems uh, for more than just the pilot they're involved in. I think that will be mm -hmm. very telling. You have to have that adoption by the employers and then on the the other side, uh, the adoption by the individuals. I'm curious to see if any of these pilots um, try to scale beyond the immediate group of folks who are involved, and uh, and and what and and you know I think part of that process on both sides is clearly defining the value of using the LERs. That I think that's still very vague. It's a, it's a great concept. Mm -hmm. But what is, you know, how will it make my life better? How will it make my life right. easier? Why should I have one more thing that I, you know, have to put my resume into and use? Right. One more sort of profile that needs to be kept updated. <laughs> yeah. Yes. This has been just such an interesting conversation. I really appreciate your your time and all of your knowledge, as well as you know, your patience with this technology. Um, oh, this, really is, this has kind of been one for the history books. But um, uh, anyway, we have to close here. It's been just fabulous uh, to talk with you. And for everyone listening, thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you for putting up with some of the technical issues that we've had and for asking such excellent questions. Um, please visit Zocalo's website, zocalopublicsquare.org, for a summary of this talk, brief interviews with both of us, 
and many other great articles and events about these sort of things that matter. Um, and please visit Issues in Science and Technology where you can read Isabel's essay titled Everything You've Ever Learned. I think this was a really nice um, Issues in Science and Technology discussion because we always try to go at, you know, not only what, how does technology and policy influence society, but what is it that we do not anticipate? And here we are, we've been doing these Zoom webinars for a year and a half. We think we're pretty pro at them. And, and suddenly we're falling off the phone and back onto the internet and all of this. But um, I thank you very much for putting up with all of it. And, and, uh, and I'm sure it will be much better in um, probably 10 minutes, to be honest. Uh, and um, and thank, you, <laughs> thank you to our partners at Zocalo. This has been a wonderful conversation and, and really makes us kind of think about the future in a new way. So I hope you all have a wonderful evening and thank you very much, Isabel. Thank you.